One glass of water for all of us to share. Yeah. That's, that's sort of the spirit of Obamacare. <laughs> Rationing. That's right. Thank you all, and thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. This is going to be a fun discussion, hopefully a little lively. We are not going to complain anymore about Obamacare, or as I like to refer to it, the Patient Exposure and Unaffordable Care Act puke up. <laughs> we're going to talk about actual market-based reforms. And uh, we're going to start with a little bit of theory, then go through a little bit of politics, and then some reality. First of all, obviously, we have to address the King v. Burwell this, uh, decision by the Supreme Court. And um, I read uh, Justice Scalia's opinion, quite entertaining. And uh, yeah, you want to know what, what this decision was, I recommend you read that 47-page opinion or whatever. But in, in lieu of that, we'll have Philip Klein give his observations. Well, I, I think that the, the Supreme Court decision uh, and the consequences of it basically reinforces the idea why it's incumbent upon conservatives to advance health care alternatives because ultimately we can't depend on the Supreme Court uh, to, Im to decide the law uh, as it's written. Um, there were two major cases between the Supreme Court now uh, and both of them sided and figured out a way to rewrite the law in order to save Obamacare. So we can't, so that we can't depend on the Supreme Court and we have to think of ways to come up with alternatives uh, in order to uh, advance free market principles. And the reason why this is so important is that uh, healthcare is on the, the current trajectory is to expand to blow a hole in the federal budget. It's the, it's the largest driver of the federal deficit. Uh, Obamacare uh, is adding to the, the spending levels, it's restricting choice for doctors, and it's moving us closer to a single-payer system. Um, insurers are having problems with uh, signing up enough young and healthy people to make the insurance market stabilized over, and this is going to become more and more of a problem over time. So the, the problem that conservatives have is that if they do nothing, then all, all of this is going to continue on autopilot. And it doesn't mean that the status quo is going to stay the same. It means that there's going to be another uh, effort to reform health care at some point down the road. And if Republicans don't do anything, then it's going to be fought on the left's terms. And the left is going to blame all of the problems that we predicted uh, were going to result from Obamacare. They're going to blame it on the free market and say that the problem with Obamacare was that it didn't go far enough in taking enough power away from the, the free market and the private enterprise, and it'll move even closer to uh, a British-style healthcare system. So the only way to counter that is to make sure that the next time there's a fight over healthcare, that it's done on our terms, and that's to advance free market-based solutions. Yes, John. thank you, I, I absolutely agree. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> Uh, King v. Burwell was an interesting decision. Uh, I'm from Washington, D.C. I put up forward a proposal to respond to King v. Burwell, and of course we were waiting for Congress to put forward a proposal, and we heard many stories that they were ready, uh, the leadership in both chambers said, you know, we're ready to respond if the decision comes in favor of King, and now we will never know what that response was. I wouldn't blame you if you thought maybe there wasn't really a fully baked response. That means the onus is on all of us uh, to keep working, keep pressing forward to develop a conservative reform. And Philip Klein's book is great at describing the three different schools of thought. And it's going to take uh, a little more effort uh, for us and for the politicians to develop what that alternative is. Many in Congress have proposed very good bills to reform the health system. Uh, Congressman Sessions of Texas has just proposed one. Uh, a universal refundable tax credit that anybody can use to buy any health insurance they want. 
Uh, it's based on the ideas in this book, uh, which I'm actually, uh, I was told to hold it up because uh, <laughs> uh, I'm replacing the speaker who wrote this book, as many of you know, uh, but it's the same ideas as I propose. Uh, so we have some time and space now, but uh, we shouldn't fritter it away. Uh, we have to keep moving forward and developing those reforms that are going to reduce the power of the federal government and improve patient care. One of the obvious first steps, in my opinion, before starting on any health care reform um, is to obey the Constitution. And knowing that, knowing that the Ninth and Tenth Amendments res, uh, uh, restrict what the federal government is supposed to be able to do and says that the states and the people should be able to make the majority of the decisions what do you think the proper role of the federal government is in health care reform, both theoretically and realistically? Because realistically, we've already violated the, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments with Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're looking theoretically, it's pretty clear, as laid out by the Constitution, that the Constitution uh, allows, enumerates the powers that go to the federal government, and anything that's not done by the federal government should be a state issue. And mo almost everything in the Constitution under the enumerated powers has to deal with things such as national security and patent laws, raising armies, and that sort of thing. So there's not really a constitutional role for the federal government in health care. Now, that said, uh, we've obviously gone, gone very far down the path of uh, you know, of having the federal government involved. I mean, basically federal programs account for nearly half of a government, half of all spending in the United States about, uh, on health care. Um, and in, among the, the spending that's not directly done by the government, it's affected by the fact that the government rigs the tax code in favor of the um, the employ getting insurance through the employer rather than the individual. And so this was all existing before Obamacare and Obamacare exacerbated it. So I think the question is sort of keeping in mind the theoretical principle that the idea is to give as much power to states and to the people. The question then becomes how to, and this is the challenge for all healthcare plans offered on the right, is how within the current system do we get as close as possible to replicating a free market type system, um, knowing that, yeah, we're not likely to return to a, a, con a fully constitutional government anytime soon. Isn't that, that's a good, a fully constitutional government, yes. Well, I'd say there's a number of, 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 of ways to tackle the question. One is the regulation of health insurance. And there's no federal role whatsoever, whatsoever in the regulation of health insurance. And that, that's something upon which I'm very hardcore uh, until the uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, uh, 1996, there was no federal role at all. States have had insurance commissioners since the 19th century. The National Association of Insurance Commissioners uh, was founded in 1843. Uh, if you buy auto insurance and you live in Colorado, and you move to Florida, uh, you call your auto insurer, tell them your new zip code, and there'll be a minor adjustment in premium. There's no drama. There's no crisis. There's no difficulty. The reason is you own your own auto insurance. Your employer doesn't own your own auto insurance. There is no federal law governing how automobile insurance is sold across state lines or how it's governed. They just figured it out over many decades insurance codes cohere and make sense so that the same for life insurance, same for any other kind of insurance that's attached to the person. I think Philip absolutely nailed it once again. We have a tax code which says if you get your health benefits from your employer, it's exempt from your taxable income. We have been habituated to it since World War II. None of us in this room can remember any other system. And that makes it very difficult to communicate an alternative. And I'm really glad that every Republican alternative, whether it's a tax credit, whether it's a tax deduction, says equal treatment. Whether you get your health insurance on your own or through your employer, 
whatever the tax preference is, it's the same. Because we're so habituated to this status quo, it's hard to realize how inefficient it makes the system. So let me give you a parallel. Many of you own your home and you took advantage of a mortgage interest tax deduction. It's not exactly the same as being exempt from taxable income, but I think you can get the similarity. Suppose I said to you, you're not really capable of deciding the home that's right for you. We want you to have a home. We think it's an important benefit. But you are not capable of making that decision on your own. Your employer should make that decision. So the only way you get a mortgage interest tax deduction is if you get the home your employer chooses for you. When you change jobs, you have to move out of your home and move into another home chosen by the next employer. Who would vote for that? But we accept it in health insurance. That is insane. Speaking of health insurance, um, as some of you know, I've been a patient um, a great deal in the last year, and especially in the last few months. Um, thank you for your well wishes, by the way. Uh, so I have, I have one of uh, an entire stack, right, of hospital bills and surgeon's bills and all this stuff. Okay, so here's, here's one. I just brought one page of it. Um, it says, amount billed. This is the charge, $296. Discount, $266.47. You saved $266.47. It actually says that. You saved that much. What my plan paid out of the $296, the insurance company reimbursed the provider $29.53. A 90% discount. The insurance company reimbursed 10%. So then, you know, I didn't have to owe anything. Yippee, isn't this great? So, the problem is, what does that $296 mean? Where did that come from? Why is it there? Why is that charge so high? And then the insurance company reimburses at 10% of that charge. This is, this is the part that kind of makes me crazy. Because Patients see that charge. They see that big number and go, oh my gosh, I could never pay for health care myself. So at, at these prices, but they don't see that if they were only if they only had to pay $29, they say, shoot, yeah, I'll write a check. John, can you comment on that? Yeah. Well, it's a conspiracy. And it's a conspiracy between the hospital and the insurance companies. And the point of the conspiracy is to convince you, to demoralize you, to humiliate you, to think that you could not possibly navigate the healthcare system if you controlled your own money. And until about 10 years ago, none of us really did control very much of our money. We might have had a five or $10 copay, but now many of us in the employer-based market and in the individual market are responsible for a much greater share of spending directly. And we have health savings accounts, we have health reimbursement accounts, we have flexible spending accounts, but they are frustrating in many ways because it's very difficult, unless you're getting a prescription filled at a pharmacy, most other healthcare services, it's very hard to figure out what the out-of-pocket payment will be before or during the actual transaction. And it achieves two goals. From the health insurer's perspective, it tells you, we negotiated 90% off the hospital bill and you could not have done that yourself, which is ridiculous. I'll explain why in a second. From the hospital's perspective, it allows them to construct and concoct a completely artificial price system. It's called the charge master, if you're in the hospital business. And it allows them to go to the government and say, you know what, we spent so much money on uncompensated care. And when they go to say, we spent so much money on compensated care, they use this price that is actually 10 times the actual price it costs them to deliver the service. So it serves the interests of both the hospitals and the insurers, but it doesn't make any sense uh, for patients or for taxpayers or anybody else. Now, if you, it, it, it's not impossible for hospitals or any other healthcare provider to tell you, uh, I'm going to do this to you and it's going to cost you $2,000. It's not impossible. It happens all the time. The MD Anderson uh, hospital system down in uh, Houston is perhaps the world's leading cancer facility. 
Uh, if you go there as an American patient, you will be subject to this kind of nonsensical billing procedure. If you're uh, uh, from an Arab country, or from uh, Latin America, or from Canada, they have an office of people who speak Spanish and Arabic who will talk to you about your procedure and will say, uh, right, you need uh, an oncologist, you need a this, you need a that, the drugs, the facility fee, it'll cost you $10,000. It's easy to do, it's, it's doable, but the system conspires against that. Yeah, I think the important thing to underscore is that for, in order to have a free market in anything, a real consumer market, there are two things that are absolutely necessary. One is the consumer has to have an incentive to shop around for the best deal. And the second thing is that there has to be transparency as far as price. The people always ask, why, ha why is the US healthcare system so, so expensive? And the reason is that neither of those things exist in the US healthcare system. There is not much incentive people have to shop around for the best deal in healthcare because most people assume that either their government or their, their, work, their employer or the insurance companies are all going to fight it out and somehow whatever they have is going to get paid for down, down the line. Um, and there's no transparency because uh, of bills like this where nobody knows anything and there's just these ridiculous hospital bills. Um, if anyone ever tried to make sense of a hospital bill, uh, you, you know what I'm saying. And so this is, this is a problem and this is at the core of what any market-based reform has to do, is you have to start changing the incentive structure so that people have interest in trying to get the, the best deal for something. Because um, as Milton Friedman, uh, the late and great uh, economist have once pointed out, uh, there, the healthcare system is really unique in that every other aspect of the US consumer um, economy, an improvement in technology has been associated um, with better quality at lower costs. And that hasn't been true uh, in the healthcare sector. And liberals try to say, well, it's natural that as we come up with more treatments and so forth, that things are gonna get more expensive. But there's no reason to believe that at all. It should be the opposite, and it would be if we had an actual uh, healthcare system that was transparent and had the, the right incentive structure. Understanding that um, one of the main reasons that Obamacare was justifiable when it was passed was that it ensures the um, indigent, and not just the uninsured, that's a whole other set of, of people, but that, that we were gonna take care of the people who couldn't afford health insurance. We were gonna take care of the people who were not getting health care, who were being turned away from emergency rooms, which never happened. But, um, so, so it was because of the indigent. So unless we have a plan for taking care of the truly indigent, uh, we're not going to get very far with the people or the media. John. Well, that's true, but I, I'd, I'd like to point out that Obamacare expanded Medicaid dramatically. About half the people who are covered by the Obamacare bill are on Medicaid, which is the joint state federal program for indigent people. And there's no good evidence. There's a, a, a body of evidence that's scattered, and some show good results, some show bad results. But overall, there's not better access to care people with a Medicaid card versus uninsured people. People with Medicaid will more likely go to the emergency room than uninsured people will because they don't have access to primary care doctors or other doctors because the fees for Medicaid are so low. So putting more people on Medicaid uh, just doesn't really solve the problem. What we would like to see, the proposal that we've got in this book, uh, we advocate a universal tax credit We've put a number on it. It's $2,500 a person, $8,000 for a family. And you use that plus your own money to buy whatever health insurance you think is right. If that's not enough, if that doesn't do the trick and you don't have enough income, you can't buy health insurance, that amount of money then goes to fund the indigent care. Uh, if, if insuring the indigent versus providing care directly to the indigent, there's not much of a difference except you're providing, uh, you're giving insurance company overhead. Now, 
if I were to say to you, uh, the indigent are also homeless, right? I like using homes as an analogy, right? Remember my mortgage interest tax deduction? So we have a problem with some homeless people and that we don't want them to live out in the streets. We want them housed. We don't overturn the whole housing market of the United States. The, the, almost all people who are housed and say we're going to turn that upside down with federal government regulation in order to solve the problem of some indigent people. And uh, again, you asked about the federal government. The, to ask the federal government to solve that problem is ludicrous. And I actually wrote a kind of a, an essay that I, 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 it took me a long time to get the guts to publish it, but it was after the president's speech to the Catholic Healthcare Association. And, uh, you know, I'm a Catholic, but I know many Catholics who are very critical of the Catholic hospitals uh, in that they're extremely dependent on the federal government. And if you went back 100 years, uh, I don't, Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, Jewish, whatever, and talk to the, 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 the people of faith who founded those hospitals and said, we in our community have a duty to take care of these indigent people and put them in a time machine and shot them 100 years forward and saw the legacy of the hospitals they founded was one of utter dependence on the federal government, I, I think they would be quite shocked. Yeah, I just say, you know, just to start with, again, I wouldn't say that conservatives should concede the point. Uh, that it's any sort of role of government to provide universal health care. And I think that that's important to say at the outset. That having been said, even if you wanted to have some sort of system that provided basic level of care for the indigent, uh, Obamacare went about it poorly. And um, there was an interesting uh, experiment that led to some interesting studies in Oregon, which is that a few years ago in Oregon, they expanded their Medicaid program, but they didn't have enough money to offer it to everybody. So they had a lottery system in which you know, whoever won got to enroll in Medicaid. So this actually created an opportunity for social scientists to look at it and compare the population of the people that were able to get Medicaid with those who went without it. And what they found was that there was no discernible difference in physical health outcomes between the people that were on Medicaid and the people that didn't have it. And a follow-up uh, study based on the same experiment found that for every dollar uh, that the federal government spends on Medicaid, patients only get 20 to 40 cents of benefit. Now what these two things tell me is that basically if you wanted to have some sort of care for the indigent, what would make sense would be to have a basic level of care that's there for them in the case of some massive catastrophic disaster that prevents them from going bankrupt and going into financial ruin from, any, from a small thing. But what Obamacare does is that it says that not only does it say everyone has to purchase health insurance, the federal government says everyone must purchase this type of, federal, this type of health insurance and they specify all the benefits that every plan has to offer in the United States to qualify for the mandate. And that's just drastically, and I think underscored by study after study, that's unnecessary. There's no reason to think that more comprehensive health insurance is gonna make people healthier. Great, thank you. Now, um, back a little bit to some theory. Uh, it would be nice to think of it as potential reality, perhaps. What do you think the federal government could realistically accomplish if, if we had a Republican Congress, Republic, or a Republican House, Republican Senate, and a Republican President? Well, I, I think it obviously depends on how large the majorities are, because some of these things, some things that you'd want to do would require 60 votes in the Senate. Some you may be able to get away with with 50 votes. It's kind of a, a tricky uh, uh, sort of Washington, uh, you know, procedural uh, debate. Uh, but I think that, you know, as I outline in my book, uh, Overcoming Obamacare, there are basically three different ways to approach um, the, the current problem that, that in the healthcare system. And one way of thinking it, one group of scholars looks at it and sort of says, look, at this point, it's unrealistic to fully repeal Obamacare. It's been in the books for several years. Industry has built it, begun to 
build its, uh, its business model around it. It's unrealistic that we're going to be able to completely get rid of it. So we have to find a way to reform the healthcare system in a more market-oriented uh, direction without sort of holding out for full repeal. Um, there's another uh, group of scholars, which I call uh, the Replace School, uh, and these are people who say that Obamacare definitely needs to be fully repealed. However, <laughs> they'd argue that in order to achieve repeal and to make it credible, Republicans have to offer some sort of alternative that it's at least competitive with Obamacare in terms of how many people um, it covers. And then there's the third group, which I call the restart school. And these are people who say that Obamacare needs to be completely scrapped and we need to start over from scratch and building a more market-based system. And so, I mean, I, I think that the, you know, the purist in me would prefer that we go, you know, we just completely demolish it and start from scratch and move to a really free market system that's focused on costs. Uh, but, I mean, there is that famous quote from William F. Buckley where he talked about supporting the most viable conservative in a race. And I think that for Republicans it's re and conservatives, it's really going to come down to what's the most viable, most conservative health insurance plan. And I don't know if that totally gets at your question because part of it is it really depends on 2016. And that's why I think that it's important for people to sort of rally around one of these approaches uh, to try to put pressure on uh, the 2016 uh, presidential candidates. Hey, I'm here from the death panel. <laughs> and thank you all. It's been great. That's all our time. We need to thank John Graham of Independent Institute, Philip Klein of Washington Examiner, Dr. Jill Vecchio, Centennial Institute, Healthcare Policy Fellow. Thank you very much, panelists.